So in ancient times, they didn't listen to music like this. But we are on an ancient road, the Grand Trunk Road, halfway between Lahore and Jhelum. We woke up really early this morning, not to beat the fog, which you really can't do around this time of year in the Punjab. Nice, thick, beautiful fog. It's not so lovely to drive through, but thanks to uh, trusty driver Majid. Salaam alaikum Majid. Shukriya ki aap itni jaldi urke aaj subah. We woke up very early, pushed off from Lahore, and we are on our way, probably halfway, to Jhelum, where we're going to meet the great Paul Salopek. Paul is a saintly figure, I would say. He's undertaking the kind of mission that is not just once in a lifetime, but once and forever. Probably no one has attempted to walk across or around the entire world, tracing the footsteps of ancient Stone Age man. He's gone from Ethiopia through the Arabian Peninsula, parts of Central Asia and the Caucasus, down through Afghanistan, and he happens to be right here in Pakistan. So we're going to go meet up with him, walk with him, and talk with him about what he's been doing. But for now, we're on this great artery, the Grand Trunk Road, this ancient crossroads of civilizations, along which we'll be passing the ruins of great empires, of history, and looking at some very, very colorful modes of transportation that traverse it today, like these trucks. You know you're on the Grand Trunk Road when you see some of these loud, blaring, and uh, loudly colored trucks. Let's get a look at one right here. So far, so good. Now, this highway actually has lines on it. This is one of the good sections. Many parts of the Grand Trunk Road are uh, more known for drivers casually just picking what side of the road they're going to go on based on the mood or the music. So it's my extremely deep honor to have as my first guest on Paragastan, Paul Salopek, who's been walking for five years now almost, from Ethiopia, through Arabia, Southwest Asia, Caucasus, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and now Pakistan. Here we are on the banks of the Jhelum River in Punjab, um, and we cross paths. We've yes. been in touch for a couple of years, but yeah. here we are. First time, yeah. uh, it's an honor. It's Great. truly, truly Great. an honor. Can we start from the beginning? Mm -hmm. It's 2013, mm -hmm. and you're mapping out the longest walk in human history mm -hmm. with editors, producers, the team, National Geographic, the other sponsors. What are you thinking? Are you thinking, I'm gonna take 10 years of my life and go around the world and, you know, sort of uh, kiss it all goodbye? Mm -hmm. Right, well, it's, it, it was gonna be seven at the beginning. Right. Now it's already longer. I'm behind, yeah. behind schedule by a couple years. It's been too interesting. Kiss it all goodbye? No, more like embrace it more closely yeah. because, as you know, um, I've been doing this more or less off and on my yeah. whole career, but just not on foot mostly. I covered Africa for almost a decade. Right. As you know from Africa, to get to, to many stories, you have to go off the roads yeah. and uh, you go into villages. So I've been kind of doing this, um, preparing for this journey right. for a long time subconsciously so now it's just more kind of a burrowing in so do you view this whole endeavor whether it's seven years yeah. or it'll probably wind up being 12 years uh, as just you know it, almost indefinite that's such a long period of time it is effectively indefinite that's that's right it's be, it's become my life at this point yeah. you know when I when you mentioned the scenario of getting together say in a conference room in Washington with National Geographic editors and other partners I have educational right. partners that include Harvard uh, and the Pulitzer Center in discussing this in the abstract, that's one thing. But, but over the last five years now, this has become my norm. And what I tell people is that, you know, it takes a good decade to write a good novel. Yeah. So it's yeah. not that big of a commitment in terms of the extraordinary amount of time. It's, to do something well, you, you require time. And uh, for everyone out there, no one has ever done this before, right? Uh, along this route, I don't think so. I don't. Yeah, people are walking really long distances. Yeah. Um, people are doing it for a variety of reasons, but nobody, I think, is doing it for like what I call slow journalism. Right. And uh, how much of the route needs to track to the ancient human migration patterns? You know, 70,000 years ago, right. um, wandering out of Africa. Of course, mankind took different directions and colonized eventually all the continents. Right. But how much is your route hewing to those genetic routes? Um, 
as closely as possible. And as you point out, this this is not a random journey from from one continent to another. The idea is to rewalk the original pathways of human migration out of Africa. Right. And what scientists tell us is that we went from Africa to Eurasia, and then a group of us came down into the New World to the tip of South America. So I guess my ultimate destination is Tierra del Fuego, which is right. a long ways away. Yeah. So I am consulting archaeologists, paleontologists, and geneticists um, as I go about migration corridors, including this one. This was a major one right. between Central Asia and South Asia um, along this river. Um, but sometimes obstacles intervene, yeah. such as yeah. getting visas or wars, and yeah. I get knocked off these routes. Right. That's all part of the journey. Yeah. Our ancestors got knocked off by glaciers as they well. They did indeed, that's right. Actually, the glaciers retreated in Asia faster than they did in Europe. So I think historically, right, we saw humankind develop uh, agriculture and urban settlements sooner in this part of the world. Yep. It was interesting for you because you're contrasting through the slow journalism, the ancient rituals of mankind, the stone tools and fossils mm -hmm. that you're discovering, with some of the largest mega cities of the 21st century that you're walking towards now, especially as you head into India. How, you know, uh, this is a big shift that you're about to head into. You haven't really encountered any huge Asian mega cities so far, but you're you're about to, right? That's right, and, and you're, you put your finger on it. I think one of the most, for me, compelling aspects that are kind of wired into this foot journey what's what's fascinating to me as a storyteller is that it does combine really deep history with with exploding current events and you know whether or not we choose to look back to see if there are lessons we can we can absorb or learn from as we go forward that's up to each individual but it's connected whether we like it or not right and so going from a largely rural sometimes desolate landscape through Central Asia into these massive cities that are going to be boiling with activity will be a major change. But doing it on foot, I have to keep coming back, is really special because you see transitions that you don't see when you're flying or when you're driving a car. And as you know, the most chaotic interface in the world is not rural or urban, it's where they bump together, right? That, that, that ring of chaos is where anything happens. So this is a transition point that we are at right now. We are literally on the Jhelum River, which has ancient names in Sanskrit and in Greek, mm -hmm. uh, which is a reminder, of course, of this being a connector in right. a way, a right. place where Alexander the Great came and crossed this river. It's also where along this river you have found uh, ancient Hindu temples as yes. well, which is a reminder of the melting pot nature of the civilizations right. that have occupied this space. Coming uh, east from Arabia, down from Central Asia, Turkic Persian civilizations, and up from India. They've all collided right here. So what have been your impressions from the Jhelum civilization? It, it is a crossroads yeah. on top of a crossroads. Right. On top. It's like a palimpsest. Yeah. One society erases, tries to erase the history of its previous power center, and then it, it in turn gets erased. But you always see the traces here. So walking in the last few days, past mosques, past old Hindu temples, past um, elements of, you know, sites where allegedly there was a, you know, a Hellenistic influence, mm -hmm. uh, major battles were fought here, where kind of the western polity and the eastern polity met in this right. maze of rivers. It's always been a contact zone. Right. And we are perpendicular to the Grand Trunk Road, which is, of That's course, right. an ancient trade artery linking Kabul through, uh, through modern day, I right. guess you would say, Pakistan, Afghanistan, which actually stretched all the way really to the Bay of Bengal. That's right. Uh, and uh, so we're going to be walking along that route. You've already been walking along this, this Grand Trunk Road. So you have the, the natural geography of the river that's mm -hmm. been a connector and the physical geography, the infrastructural geography of the roads together being that passageway, the Grand Trunk Road to me is very sort of representative of this transition point from the Central Asia that you've now spent, what, a year or two? A year and a half. Now, a year and a half mm -hmm. getting into now the South Asian civilization. But of course, it's been intersected so much by borders, yes, right? And right. Uh, you've had difficulty, the Afghan-Pakistan border, the Pakistan-Afghanistan uh, border. Hopefully you'll have a smoother crossing across the Pakistan-India border, which actually happens to be one of the most fortified borders in the world. You can right. see it from space, wow. 3,000 kilometers of floodlights, heavily militarized, and yet it's, of course, bureaucratized and formalized, so it right. should be relatively right. easy. But, you know, you see these, uh, in fact, you wrote this to me maybe a year ago, we were emailing, you said Asia is this... Uh, 
vast mosaic of micro worlds knitted together by mystical forces. You know, it's a very beautiful way of capturing it. And yet you have to cross these borders. Um, you know, even for people like me who are sort of you know, born in the region, my own family, of course, is divided between India and Pakistan. It, as a foreigner, still, you must find it frustrating, maddening, disappointing to see this beautiful mosaic of cultures that has so much fusion be divided in this way. What, what, have, what have been your thoughts about it's, that? It's, and it's something I've run into when you slow down. Again, it, it, it influences the way you look at the world. It's, it's striking. It's striking when you're going quickly and you have this mosaic and you see colors flash by. When you slow down, you get to linger in the colors a little longer, but the boundaries between the colors are there. Um, I've spoken with my walking partners, um, my Pakistani walking partners, my sense after walking a few months with Pakistan is that Pakistanis themselves don't know each other, right? right? People from the far north of Hunza don't really know people from Karachi too much or from other parts. It's, it is still, there are these silos, even though they share a national identity, which is fairly new in the stream of history. Um, it is striking. It is like walking through microstates and everybody has perceptions about each other. I have to make reintroductions to myself to every microstate that I go through. So it's both a challenge, but it also keeps things interesting. You know? To me, I associate this whole Grand Trunk Road and this region with smell. Mm -hmm. And I think about the smell of grilled lamb shashlik. <laughs> and yeah. it smells similar and tastes great from Western China, mm -hmm. Uyghur area, mm -hmm. Kashgar, certainly into Uzbekistan, right, the Turkic civilization, right. and right down here into Pakistan, right? right. Food yes. that they share is mostly yes. one of the things that you. The food is carry. shared. You know, yeah. there's this like there's this there's this topography of food that's like the bedrock. But then, like on one side of Himalayas, there's a new there's a there's a watershed of Kerai. There's a watershed of, of right. spices yeah. that don't exist on the north, uh -huh. where they use mainly salt. Right. right. So, yeah, it's a topographic journey it's on the palate as well. It's a, it's a t uh, journey through the taste buds. Amazing. I am just the guest host today for Zara's Travels. This is Zara's Travel Show, and this is reaching out to all the followers of Okta, the chatbot that helps kids travel around the world, and certainly for grade three at United World College Southeast Asia in Singapore. You're joined by the great traveler, wanderer, Paul Salopek, who's been walking basically around the world over a 10 year period. A real inspiration for all the young travelers out there. And we have some questions for you, rapid fire, okay. to help inspire all the young travelistas and travelistos okay. around the world, wherever they may be. So, of course, young kids like Zara love camping and they want to know, and especially they love to sleep in gares and nicely decorated yurts in places like Mongolia. But you've been doing the real rugged camping, uh, so they want to know how many nights do you spend camping in a tent versus how much time do you get to spend in hotels? And, you know, where do you take a bath? How do you take a shower? Well, as, as all the young travelers will know when they go on holiday, it depends on where you go. So yeah. the last year and a half through Central Asia has been a lot of camping because I've covered big deserts, big mountains. And until I came to here, to Pakistan, I was camping out every night for probably six weeks, wow. maybe even closer to day, maybe two months. And then once I come into an inhabited zone like here, I stay at Sheikh Hanaz, I stay at local uh, truckers' hotels, uh, stay with families. So it depends. It really varies from landscape to landscape. Kids love campfires and roasting marshmallows. Do you ever get to do that? Make a campfire, cook your own meal? I actually had roasted marshmallows last week, believe it or not, at a wedding in Islamabad. It was the first roasted marshmallow of my life because I didn't grow up in America and that was a new food for me. Now, you've had some animal companions. Uh, kids love animals. Usually they get to ride on them. When you've been going up and down the mountains, you've actually had the animals carrying some stuff, like some donkeys. Is the donkey the best pack rat out there, the mule, the donkey, or have there been other kinds of animals that have been helping you? So I started uh, using camels in Africa and then used them again through Saudi Arabia. In Jordan, I used mules. In Turkey, I used a mule. Uh, in uh, Central Asia, I used horses and mules and donkeys. So I've used, I think what's left, llamas maybe when I get right. to South America. There you go. It's really fun to travel with big animals. They have personalities and they change the nature of your walk. They, you know, they become a partner in work and they look out for you because they're carrying some of your food and water and you have to look out for them. And that means looking for grass to feed them at the end of the day, looking for water. And actually, in that way, animals become your teachers because they teach you to focus and look harder at the landscape. Zara's favorite donkey's name is Trekker. 
Yeah, uh, Trekker was in Bhutan. Okay. And her favorite camel's name is Sandy. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> from a uh, very appropriate name. Yes. That was from the Emirates. Now, we have a saying in our house, which is, the little kannas must always travel light. <laughs> Take only what you can carry by yourself. Now, here's a man who is taking, traveling for 10 years, and all he has is, let's have a look, this backpack. That is it, everyone. Kids, travel light like Uncle Paul. That is really it, isn't it? It is it, yes, that's it. And that's uh, too heavy as it is. I wish it were smaller. <laughs> wow. So one thing that Zara wanted to know is, and she was quite fearful when, when thinking about this question, have you ever been robbed? No. Other than the water canisters. The and, water uh, canister, yeah. yeah. So but that's, that was, your stuff. That was off of me, no robbery yet, knock on wood. So for the kids out there who are studying human history, human geography, which I'm very pleased to say is now an advanced placement course uh, in the United States, it's an AP course, so human geography is becoming much more prominent. I certainly encourage kids out there to major in geography. Yeah. They would love to know, how did you choose this route? What's the grand inspiration? I'm following the campfires of the first people who spread out of Africa on foot. So. Um, Let's just say that I'm following the first people who discovered the world. And they left very faint traces, stone tools, sometimes they left their bones. But the coolest thing is they left us this little map of the world of our first migration and all of ourselves. So each one of you is carrying a small map of the first human migration around the world in your DNA. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. And um, so how long is it going to take? Originally seven years, but now if you had to put a date on it, yeah. When should they come meet you in Tierra del Fuego? Yes, well, you know, I'll have to give you like a year's advance warning because I'm walking really slowly, but probably 2023, 2024. And don't tell my editors, maybe they'll look at me on that. 2024, 2024. So let's see if the kids, 2017, they're eight years old now. So when you're 15 yes. and you're old enough to uh, yeah. hop on a plane Secondary by yourself, school, yeah, yeah. plan on a flight down to Tierra del Fuego, by then they could probably catch a cruise to Antarctica. Well, that's it. Uh, you keep going if you wish. Yeah. Maybe that's how you'll celebrate, you think? We've talked about that actually. Yeah? yeah oh, okay. Yeah. So it's uh, going to be a great gathering of all the people who walk with me, including the man who's holding the camera in Ayat Nali. All my walking partners, I'm going to fly them down. I'm going to walk together to the, uh, the last tip of the world that our ancestors reached to maybe 7,000 years ago. There'll be hundreds of people from all over the world. Wow. Uh, count me in. Yes, I'm inviting course. myself. Yes, that's right. You're walking with me. So and uh, there'll be a lot of penguins, without a doubt, that's uh, true. down that's true. there. Yes. Well, Zara has a little gift for you. She okay. couldn't bring deliver to you herself, but uh, this is her sketch of Paul's footprints and the stone tools left behind by those wandering. It's about, what, 15,000 kilometers or more total mm -hmm. and some nice snowy mountains in the background. Yeah, so Thank you, Zara. Very beautiful. For it's you. Very light. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate it. Travel smart, travel far. See you on the trail. <laughs>